Second Chronicles chapter 3. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah. Now let's look at Genesis 22 too. Genesis 22 is the Calvary of the book of Genesis. Genesis 22 too. And he said, God said, take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, this would be Abraham Isaac, Abraham being the type of God, Isaac being the type of Jesus Christ, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I which I will tell thee of. One of the mountains, where we are, verses 3, all the way to 14. He binds up Isaac, puts him on the altar. He's going to take that knife. He's going to expect the resurrection. Isaac is spared. A goat that's in the thickets is, is sacrificed instead. And when, when we come to Solomon, there it is. <clears throat> I am going to say, and I think, I, I, I'm going to say 99% sure. 100% in faith of what the Bible is studying. That this place right here is the same place many, many years ago. Isaac laid on, on an offering. And his father, Abraham, took that night. I would go so far to say that where the oracle is, where the most holy place is going to be, is that spot where Abraham and Isaac were. Who knows where that goat was? Maybe that goat would have been in the holy place. Maybe that goat where it was in the thicket, maybe it was where the brazen altar was. But here we are. David purchased this land in 1 Chronicles 21 of Ornan. We're going to see that in a minute. It's the title deed. Where the Lord appeared unto David, his father. Remember the angel of the Lord showed up. Give me three days, three years, three months before your foes. He went and purchased, it says, in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So, where, J where David built an altar and offered the sacrifice of those oxen and broke the, the instruments of the tools of the threshing and made a sacrifice to the angel of the Lord to God. Here is where the temple, the holy place, is going to sit. Right now, you got the dumb of the rock. Supposedly, where Mohammed or, or Michael, somebody of their religion, went up to heaven. No, that's, that's a lie. And God told him that temple would be gone because of the sins of Israel. It's coming back. And in this very spot that we're reading right now, the Antichrist is going to show himself three and a half years into the tribulation period. At the start of the great tribulation period, they're going to pull back that curtain and he's going to be seated there. He's going to say, I am God. And he's going to do his magic tricks in the name of Jesus Christ, of course. Hocus pocus, boom, fire comes down. Hocus pocus, you know. The one that does magic is Satan. It's not God. God has the power. Unlimited power. When uh, Elijah, he's on Mount Carmel, he tells those prophets of Baal, put no fire thereof. And what they would do is to fool the people, they put a little kindle of fire, a little coal of redness, in that, and they would wave and get that thing sparking, 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 and boom, look at it. ta -da! And when Elijah did, the fire came down from heaven. And he began to build in the second day of the second month in the fourth year of his reign. Now there's a date. Two to the fourth year of his reign. Now, these are the things where Solomon was instructed for the building of the house of God. And these are those plans that David got from God that David has handed over to Solomon. God instructed him. Solomon did not just throw it, and there it was. It was planned, it was ordered, it was designed for the building of the house of God. The length by cubits. After the first measure was three score, that would be 60 cubits, and the breadth 20 cubits. That's 1,200 square cubit feet. Well, not feet, square cubits. Moses was 30 cubits by 9 cubits. That was only 270 square cubits. So this is vast. This is more 
than what Moses and the children of Israel carried in the wilderness. And the porch, which Moses did not have, that was in the front of the house, and the length was according to the breadth of the house, 20 cubits, and the height was 120 cubits, and he overlaid it with, with, within, with pure gold. Now you walk up to this building, here's a porch. It's bright gold. You are in a desert region. You are up on a mountain. And that sun would glare upon that building and it would be bright. That would be light. It would be a light set it on a hill, Jesus said. And yet the greater light would be the light of Jesus Christ. People put Jesus Christ as their church building. That's just a light. That's not the light. And the greater house, he sealed yes, the ceiling, that's the moldings, with fir tree, which he overlaid with fine gold. So he took fir trees, he cut them, he put them up, he, he put them on the ceiling, he put them on the wall, and then he covered them with gold. Not painted gold, not the color of gold, but with gold. And set there on palm trees and chains. So he had like a wallpaper kind of thing and chains and emblems of wallpaper of, 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 of palm trees around the place. Now those were not for worship. They were for design. They were for ornaments. So you can have a wallpaper that has designs on it. The, the house of God had it and he garnished. That's the first time that word shows up. You know, you know what garnish is? When you go to a, a fancy restaurant, which I have been a few times, and they bring your plate of steak or whatever you've ordered, and they got your, your vegetables, and you got your, your starch, and they got these little leafy things or, or colorful things. You don't eat that. That's just there to make it look pretty. And the Holy Spirit has chosen that, you know, it's not for a purpose, but it makes it look pretty. And garnish the house with precious stones for beauty. Those stones did not have to be there. But Solomon and the Holy Spirit said, put them there and make them look beautiful. And when Jesus is with his disciples one day, they went, oh, Jesus, see how wonderful and beautiful this place is? <laughs> and Jesus is like, it's going to fall. It's going gonna, it's gonna to decay. It, Titus is going to come and destroy it. And then this is an example to what the new Jerusalem, with those 12 foundations of the stone. And a lot of those stones would take light and they would turn it into a prism of different colors. And imagine the light of God and Jesus Christ coming off that throne and shining through those stones. It was also the priest that would have the 12 stones on his breastplate and the two stones on his shoulders of, of beauty. And it also shows us in Ezekiel 28, the devil with his stones, his coverings, his beauty. There's something about our God and the color of beauty that we get pictures from outer space of colors and wonderful things that we will never see with the naked eye. But God sees it. We get pictures from the bottom of the oceans that men never been. And to find out when we do take a picture of stuff down there, there's beautiful colors down there. Man can't see that with his own natural ability. We have a colorful God, and imagine when we get to a place with no sin, no curse. Imagine what that garden looked like before Genesis 3. It was beautiful. It was colorful. Look at the animal kingdom. Look at the colors there are. God is a God of color. And gold, and the gold was a gold of parvithi. Parvithi, a specific gold. He overlaid also the house. The beams, the poles, that's the, you know, holding up the ceilings, the poles holding up the walls, and the walls are in, and the doors are up with gold. This entire building, inside and outside, is all gold, not painted gold, all gold. Solomon needed a lot of gold to do this, this project, and there it is. Again, this place would sparkle. And when Jesus said, a house sitting upon a, on a hill or a mountain, it's to be the light of the world. That's the temple. That was, hey, 
if I want a God, if I want the God, Ethiopian eunuch, you come to Jerusalem at that point in time. You want answers, Miss Queen of Sheba, you come to Jerusalem and you get your answers. Now, we are called the light of the world because Jesus Christ is the light of the world. We don't go to a building no more. Uh, Cornelius is searching for God. Cornelius is reaching out to God. And God sends him an angel and says, go get a Christian. And speak to a Christian. And we tell people, oh, we witness the people. We invite them to our church. That's not witnessing. The Bible says going all the world to preach the gospel. It doesn't say going all the world and invite them into the church. You're not supposed to bring the unsaved into church. You got the mess of the churches you got today because you bring the unsaved. Now you got the churches that have the world and the world events inside that church. There are more world in the church today than there are Christianity. There are more Christians that will do movie night, gamble night, bingo night, uh, uh, bounce in the house night, uh, let's have a fellowship night, than go out witnessing and tell people about Jesus. Grade with cherubims on the wall. Again, here's here's the cherubims. Here's what they look like. It's it's for beauty. It's for ornamentation. It's not for worship. You guys ever wonder how, how did Solomon know what the cherubims look like? Unless he had a picture. And I don't think they look like little chubby little babies. We know what they look like from Ezekiel. We know what they look like from from uh, John. And he made the most holy house. This is the most holy place. This is where the ark is going to go in. This is where the priest would go in only once a year, twice that day. The length whereof was according to the breadth of the house, 20 cubits. And the breadth, the, uh, the breadth thereof, 20 cubits. It's 400 square cubits. We do not have a measurement of Moses' most holy place. We have, um, it would be the nine cubics. We have that. But we don't know what the other length, maybe nine by nine, but I'm only assuming. There's something about the number 20 in the Bible, and I, I have not figured it out, and I have not heard anybody. But 20 shows up quite interesting. 20 is, is what the children of Israel sold Joseph for, 20 pieces of silver. Not 30, but 20. The most holy house, he made two cherubims, like Moses, of image work, and overlaid them with gold, just like Moses in his tabernacle. The wings of the cherubim were 20 cubits long. One wing of one cherub was five cubits, touching the wall of the house. The other wing was likewise five cubits, reaching to the wing of the other cherub. So these wings would stretch out, they would touch wall to wall, both these creatures. One wing of the other cherub was five cubits, reaching to the wall of the house. The other wing was five cubits, also joining, that's the only time that word shows up, joining, to the wing of the other cherub. So they were one piece together. Two cherubims, one piece. You see that in Ezekiel, those four cherubims, they're all together, whatever those wheels are. <laughs> whatever that... I don't want to say contraption, but whatever that thing that Ezekiel sees, those cherubims, they are one piece. Now, there's only two in the most holy place of the tabernacle, but there are four in heaven. One is missing. And I don't know if God has up in heaven two specific cherubims that are there looking at the throne all the time. But John explains to us that there are four of them. The wings of these cherubim spread themselves for 20 cubits, and they stood on their feet, and their faces were inward. I believe, and I could be wrong, but Moses, I believe they were kneeling. But they were looking at that mercy seat. They were looking at God, not looking around. So you would have the imitation of gargoyles upon that old Notre Dame, which is now gone. They're looking at God. They're looking at where the priest would put that blood. Now here's another interesting verse 14. 
He made the veil of blue, pretty, heavenly, a purple royalty, and crimson blood, and fine linen, and wrought cherubims therein. That curtain, that veil, had pictures of cherubims. Now let's look at a couple of places here. Exodus 26, 31, about this veil. Exodus 26, 31. Because this is interesting. We're going to read, and then we'll make a little side note. But Exodus 26, 31. Thou shalt make a veil of blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twine linen of cunning work with cherubim shall it be made. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with pure gold. Their hooks shall be of gold and the four sockets of silver. Thou shalt hang up the veil under the tax or tax, and thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy place. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. All right. There's the veil of Moses. Here's the veil of Solomon. Matthew 27, 51. Now, when we go to Matthew, this is not Solomon's veil. This is not Moses' veil. This would be King Herod's veil that he did the temple. But this would be the same veil that we just read in Exodus, that we just read in 2 Chronicles, Matthew 27, 51. And you can get the size. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. That veil we're looking right now that goes into the most holy place according to Hebrews 9, 3. That veil that we're reading right now that had cherubim engraved in it or how they did it. That veil, one day, when Christ dies <laughs> and the priests go into the holy place to do whatever business that has to be done at that moment. And he opens up the first veil and he sees something he has never seen that no one's ever seen but the high priest. He's looking at the Ark of the Covenant. He's looking at the mercy seat. And the Bible says it was ripped from top to bottom. That veil pictures the heavens. Through that veil, no man can get to, to God. But Jesus says, I'm the way. <laughs> I'm the truth. I'm the light. No man can get to the Father but by me. I'll tell you. How, how do you get to the Ark of the Covenant? You go through a priest? Have do, no, no, sorry. It's red. It's red. Those pretty pictures of the cherubim. And you can't sew it back up because that's not holy. And God's sure not going to allow you to make another veil and put it up. He, listen, he, he fried... Abihu and his brother named that because they came in with strange fire. Uzziah in his pride came in to offer incense because he wanted to do it. He did not need, he could not be there and God gave him leprosy. John's father, Zacchaeus, freaks out because he's in the holy place offering the prayer of the saints in the, in the holy place and he turns around and there's a man standing there. Yeah, you need to get out. Well, who are you? And Jesus goes right in through and, and deposits his blood upon that mercy seat, our great high priest. There's that veil. Now, it's not the veil that Jesus rents because this place is torn apart by the Babylonians. Ezra's temple has been changed. Herod, my understanding, somehow did, did the temple. It would be Herod's veil. But it would be on the same fashion, the same measurements, the same deal. Also, he made before the house two pillars. Now, these are interesting. These pillars are mentioned throughout. 
They're standing outside the house. These two pillars, they're even mentioned when Babylon comes and destroys Jerusalem, destroys the temple. They are broken in pieces and carried to Babylon. Two. I don't, know, I don't know why 22, 1, 2, of 30 and 5 cubics high. The chapter, that's that little square block you see on top of the columns. The chapter that was on the top of each of them were 5 cubics. So all together, the length of those, cubic, uh, those pillars are 40 cubics. 40 is the number of testing. Five is the number of death. He made chains, as in the oracle. The oracle is the most holy place. And put them on the heads of the pillars. So you look at these pillars, they got some kind of chain work on it. And a hundred pomegranates. <laughs> so here are chains and pomegranates decorating these columns. And put them on the chain. So here are chains, and the chains have pomegranates on them. And he reared up, put up the pillars before the temple. One on the right hand, and one on the left. And called the name of that on the right hand, Jotkin, which means established. And the name on the on the left. For his grandpa, Boaz? I don't know. But that means strength. So before you walk in the temple, on your left hand side you got established, on the right hand you got strength. What a way to describe God. And those pillars were of brass. Brass means judgment. <laughs> God is established in strength of judgment before you come into his house. So you want to make the temple, you want to make the, the, the building your church house where you come to worship God. Before you enter those doors, you better go through establishment. You better go through strength. You better go through judgment. And many Christians do not do that at all. I remember times when I first got saved, I would go into church. When I came into church, I would see people, very few, but I would see people at the altar praying before church service. I can tell you right now, a family that I know right now, no president right now, they would be, they would, before church started, they, as husband and wife, as daughter, would go up to the altar, they would kneel down, and they would pray before the services. And God is using them wonderfully and great. Been a while since I've seen people go up. And, listen, there were times, great preachers, and when the services were conducted, what you didn't see in the background, there were men in other rooms while the preacher was preaching. They would be in those rooms on their knees praying for the whole service. That God would work in the hearts of the lost, that God would work in the hearts of the saved, God would work in the mouth of that preacher. And those churches you were going today, they would bring you into this room, they would show you that the floor has been engraved, the floor has been rutted, the floor has been redesigned by the knees of those men kneeling there the, during the whole service. You know why we're lacking today? Even for myself, because we don't pray as we should. We don't put, the Bible says judge ourselves, not others. 